This is episode 42, titled Service Above Self, Building Hope for the Future of Others. It's subtitled, Who Do I Want to Be? A Life-Enhancing Question. Today's conversation is with Amanda Wirtz, MPH, which of course is a Master of Public Health, today on the AlternativeHealthTools.com podcast, where we discover and share together new alternative health tools and resources from alternative health care practitioners and experts. They said, you're probably never going to be able to go to college. You know, we could put a pain pump in your spine. You're probably going to be disabled by the time you're 30, I was told. And so they'd instilled all these beliefs in me. But still, there's a part of me that thought, no, maybe not. And it started out as a maybe not and grew to a more proclaimed no over time, through time and experience of knowing I could trust the knower that knows. I could trust myself when I'm following through on what it is that I know that I need to do to take care of myself. And so it became clear to me as I did this humanitarian work and as I started receiving more hope for my own future that that was my mission, to build hope in a future for others. And it was about the everyday, showing up, seeing what opportunities come my way, you know, being bold, saying yes to myself, saying yes to the world. So welcome back to AlternativeHealthTools.com podcast. Today, we have Amanda Wirtz, and Amanda and I are in a class together. We may talk about that later. I'm not really sure. But in this class, um, I was really impressed with actually the questions that she asked. And then I later found out she has a business model that basically is called Ask the Right Question. So welcome, Amanda. Well, thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. How are you? I'm great. And that's an amazing question. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard it before? <laughs> I sort of chuckle at a business model of asking questions. Uh, yeah. Not uh, just with other people, but with myself. And that's part of what drew me to that class. And something I really respected and admired about you is that hmm. you are making a a big inquiry, not just for yourself, but it, but for the world to become a better person, to enrich yourself, and mm. what a joy to be around people like that. Yeah, so, well, thank you. Yeah, real yeah. pleasure. It's a like-minded, we might as well tell people, it's a Science of Mind Foundation class at, here at Seaside in Encinitas. That's right, and it's a essentially a practical spirituality course. I have been telling people, if you really wanted a great foundation in spirituality, whether you're coming from a any other kind of religion, this is probably the place to plug into. And I've heard that uh, Seaside in particular's education is pretty exceptional compared to other centers. And yeah. really encompassing, too. Yeah. You know, our first day, so many different stories about mm-hmm. different backgrounds, not just with religion or spirituality, but mm-hmm. perspective and career and mm-hmm. demographic, mm-hmm. all with this one heart to learn more and become more. And that's really what my question is about. Incidentally, I walked into a course that really is about that same question. That's pervasive to all of us, whether or not we're aware. Mm-hmm. Let's start a little bit at your beginning. Where are you from originally? I'm originally from a suburb of Chicago. Uh huh. North, south, east, west. Northwest, and if you're familiar with Chicago, it's just a mass uh-huh. of suburbia of yeah. highways, and strip malls, and. Uh, In the middle of that, I grew up. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, before you were 20 years old, uh, can you uh, name a defining moment you had? Maybe maybe where everything changed and you made some decisions about where you wanted your life to go? I would have to say um, I joined the military when I was 18. Oh, nice. Fresh out of high school. Were you recruited? Or is... That's funny. I was a classical violinist, a pretty nerdy kid. I loved to write poetry, mm-hmm. and I raised tadpoles in the backyard. And really? Yeah, kind of this abstract creative, paint all over my bread, bedroom walls, mm-hmm. um, musical kid. Mm-hmm. And so what would draw that little girl into joining the military? But uh, the military, for me, was an opportunity to really meet four criteria that were really super important to me. One, how do I get independent of my family? You know, God Mm -hmm. bless them. 
to alcoholic parents, a lot of dysfunction and not a real place where to thrive. Mm -hmm. And it was my time to go. And I knew that, but where would I get the structure and the support and the military seemed like it would qualify that, you know, I didn't have any support for college. So how would I get my school loans paid for? Wow. Wouldn't that be great? And then the third thing was, how do I travel on a budget? I want to live around the world. I want to experience life in different cultures and places. And how could I do that? And the military mm -hmm. seemed to qualify that. And then the fourth one was, even as a teenager, there was something inside of me that wanted to be more. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it was a bit of a, I don't know, counterculture in that, well, if I wanted to end up where the masses went, I would follow that path, and where was I going to be a pioneer, and <laughs> how was I going to stretch myself in, in a way that my peers weren't? And so um, the military seemed like a mm -hmm. great option, and they didn't approach me. There was actually a cheerleader at my school, a super beautiful girl, had a lot of friends. I was neither of those, and she joined the military, and I raised an eyebrow at that and thought, I wonder why, and that's where I found out that they actually could help with all of these things that were so important to me, and so... Perfect fit. It really was. And I, I said, you know, I don't want to be scraping barnacles off at the bottom of a boat. You know, I'm a straight A student. I love to play the violin. What have you got? And uh, they offered me an Intel job. And so I became a cryptologist. So t can you talk a little bit about that? Because cryptology, I'm not sure everybody knows what it is. And I'm going to assume I don't either. <laughs> because that's always a nice place to stop, start. I mean, a lot of times people think they know and, you know. You know, I was in it for six years, and I don't even know if I know. Oh, but really? <laughs> there's so much to know. Boy, that sounds cryptic. Or I'd have to kill you. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'll put the knives away. <laughs> I, I'm sitting, sitting here in a blue summer dress, clearly mm. not in the offensive. So Yeah, yeah. Just for all the listeners. I'm feeling safe. Yeah. I'm feeling Thanks safe. Thanks for checking in. Yeah, really. <laughs> Cryptology, a lot of people think cryptology is cartology, which is the map making. Yeah. And I have zero sense of direction. I can get lost from here to the bathroom. I have actually noticed that about you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you're okay with yeah. that. And, you've, and I embrace my strengths and weaknesses, and I ask for a lot of help. Yeah, good. From you, too. So yeah, thanks yeah. for your part. You're welcome. Not map making. That's yeah. cartology. Cryptology is code decipherment. So okay. there are two types, people who create code mm -hmm. so that our enemies cannot decipher what it is that we are communicating. And mm -hmm. then there are deciphers. So someone who will connect mm -hmm. using a variety of media to our enemies' communication and decipher mm -hmm. using pretty high-end technology what it is they are saying, mm -hmm. communicating. So I was a decipher, a code breaker. Code breaker. Uh, I went to school in the Center for Information Dominance in Florida. So that was about a year-long wow. training. Yeah. Nice. Did they at all um, <clears throat> study the Navajo, the code talkers? You know, there's a bit of history, mm -hmm. and then you're rushed into the mission, because okay. it really is about that. Right. So I probably learned more from peers along the road, talking about the history of cryptology. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily something that they went into in depth in in school. Yeah, it's not like you're looking to get a degree in it. <laughs> They're looking to like get you going in uh, the mission. Right. Yeah, that so makes sense. there once were code talkers. Now, here's how you crack into a satellite. <laughs> <laughs> really? Good. Could you crack my phone? <laughs> I cracked my phone. I cracked the screen on my phone, but I don't think that's the same. No, that doesn't qualify as the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, I don't know if you're listening, but even, you know, if you got an iPhone or another phone and you got a crack screen, you can call yourself a cracker <laughs> <laughs> or something. Okay, so where did that take you, actually? I understand that obviously you didn't stay here in the States. No, actually, they, they love to send uh, a lot of cryptologic personnel to Norfolk, mm -hmm. Virginia, big naval base. And I was highly committed to getting out of the United States. And so I worked really hard in school because your orders are based on your rank at graduation. So if you're number two, you get the second pick of orders. If you're number five, you get the fifth pick. If you're number 55, you can see where this goes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so while everybody was partying at the beach in Pensacola, I was <laughs> hunkering down in the laboratory because I thought if ever a test grade mattered, it's, it's uh, now. It's this one. Yeah. So, and there are some smart, smart people mm -hmm. there. And uh, I ended up graduating 
number one by like a tenth of a percent. Um, but you did get number one. I did. I graduated number one. I have actually the girlfriend of the uh, person who was I was competing with to thank for that because she got pregnant right in the middle of our exam. So he was dealing with this influx of, I'm 19 years old and going to be a parent to twins. You know, he worked really hard. I don't know if that threw him off. It became a joke, but I did graduate number one. So I had the pick of all of the orders that were available mm-hmm. and I had always wanted to live in Spain, and there was one billet available. So that's where I went for the next uh, two and a half years. Nice. Whereabouts in Spain? Or There's a naval base me? at Rota. Yeah. Rota. Rota, Spain. It's Rota. near Sevilla. Oh. So then what happened? So, and, and, you know, folks, just, you know, you're sitting here listening and going, where is this all going? Well, just stick with us because there's quite a, there's quite a bit that uh, happens after all this, isn't there? There's quite a bit, and this is maybe the prelude to the real story. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, you know, living in the military has its challenges. It affords mm-hmm. some incredible opportunities, but there's challenges along the way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, once I was stationed in Spain, there are some pretty significant things that occurred for me, mm-hmm. uh, one of which is that I was sexually assaulted by a, a friend a friend of a coworker, mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as a 19-year-old girl who was just... Hmm. taking on the world and felt she, she could do anything. And uh, to face that trauma, not only the trauma of being sexually assaulted, and this man was persecuted, uh, admitted to everything, but I had a lot of trust issues after that yeah. because not only did I have this experience with him, but my friends actually helped him get it, find a way into my apartment. Really? And so people that I had trusted, mm-hmm. you know, it was a sort of plotted mm-hmm. A landscape of horrors that later went on to haunt me. And I'll talk about this particular incident where that led me, but um, that was challenging. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted, like many people who face trauma, uh, to run. And I was, my command actually tried to persuade me not to press charges. And Is that were, common behavior? Or a common direction. I can't speak for, mm-hmm. for you know, for everyone in mm-hmm. my situation. And I have heard, and it has been reported that it is unfortunately way more common, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. fortunately less now because the military culture is now realizing the weight mm-hmm. and the severity of these situations that they can't be brushed, brushed under, um, under a carpet, or brushed off. Exactly, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, fortunately, there was a, something inside me that says I'm not going to stand for this. Even with my commanding officer trying to persuade me not to, mm-hmm. um, I made a very poignant statement to him and walked out of his office and basically said, I'm going to take care of myself. And uh, I'm really glad that I did. And uh, really support other people um, to do the same, you know, which is to... Sounds like a beginning of something for you. Yeah, it really was. It, and in the interim... You know, I, I also wanted to run. So mm-hmm. it's not that I, it took mm-hmm. time to come out of that. And part of this running was, um, I'm going to lose myself in sort of the next big thing. And of course, the healthy part of me that loves a challenge, uh, raised my hand to volunteer to, to go to combat. And so I was one of the first women ever to deploy in a combat ship and uh, fought in two combat deployments, one in Iraq and one in Yugoslavia on a destroyer. And the first time women on that ship, just after the ban on combat, a uh, profound experience. Mm. So in some ways, very rebuilding as far mm. as my self-esteem and my intrigue with what is and in other ways, you know, horrifying to participate and, mm. and, and see the behind the scenes as a crypt, cryptologist having the clearance to really know some some difficult things and really having a 19-year-old brain to process all of that. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. It was a bit of an adventure. And the survivor part, you know, in many ways it was great. And after that I went to the work as a NATO trainer at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Canada. Hmm. So had did a great three years there, and in many ways still still ran, still suppressed a lot of the things that I had experienced in combat and from sexual assault. But I was a survivor, and so I rechanneled that energy um, and did a lot of amazing things. Uh, as you know, I play violin, mm-hmm. 
have since I was eight. And so I began playing electric violin and took a lot of chances and started playing with bands and toured around Canada. We opened for Van Morrison at Blues Fest. I mean, it was amazing. Nice. nice. Amazing opportunities, and my heart was in it. When was that? I'm just curious, because I've, I've been a Van Morrison fan and familiar with his albums. Okay, that was in 2001. 2001. Yeah. So some incredible music experiences, and that was that's also when I was in the military, and mm-hmm. then I opened a fitness studio and started teaching aerobics, and things really seemed to be taken, taking off for me. Mm-hmm. And this childhood question that was born into me, into our culture at a very young age. What do I want to be when I grow up? The quintessential question that really was driving my life, regardless of the circumstances I had encountered, I thought, you know what? I've got this. And as an Intel analyst and a business owner and an electric violinist, I mean, it was a pretty cool life. Who gets to say, like, I'm a spy, a rock star. I own own a business. (laughs) And I had answered that question and pretty much felt impenetrable, right? And I'd weathered some of these storms and, you know, if my cocky 22-year-old, 23-year-old self said, you know, I got this. All right. So then something happened. (laughs) So as I'm transitioning Mm -hmm. um, into this new life, I thought I'm passionate about music. I'm passionate about health. I'm going to make a go for it. The military was wonderful served me well. I served it in a way that I feel proud. And it's time to write the next chapter. And And you're 22 years old. I was 24 at that time. 24. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. And so I was just transitioning out of the military, uh, literally just signing the paperwork paperwork with NSA. You know, I'm not going to tell any government secrets and um, doing all the out processing of the military. Mm. And one particular afternoon in May 2003, it was May 5th, I wasn't feeling that well. I was staying in a hotel, doing this out-processing paperwork, and I thought, something's really wrong. And I went to the hospital, and I thought, you know, maybe it's appendicitis or just some wonky stomach situation. Uh, And they didn't have any answers. And this is a problem, because not only did I have intense pain, but the whole right side of my body was swelling. So... Uh, I ended up, you know, going back to my hotel, finishing the paperwork, but I just never got better. In fact, things got worse. In a month, I went from a size 8 to a 14. In one month? In one month. It, you know, I started to be ridiculed by people who had seen me around. Oh, look. You know, I had blonde hair, and mm-hmm. I was rather fit at that time. Oh, look, Barbie's getting fat. Mm-hmm. And so not only did I feel horrified by the the pain I was experiencing in my abdomen and on the right side of my body, but also my self-esteem going down, lethargy, depression set in all very quickly. Mm-hmm. And in for, with the medical institution, I was just saying, well, we don't really have any answers. That's tough when they don't know. It, it's tough. So many people have been in that situation, sure. unfortunately. And it becomes a trauma of itself. It does. Because not only do you have the pain, but you have this giant looming question mark that's casting a shadow in your life. Mm-hmm. You know, what does this mean for my career? What does this mean for health insurance? What does this mean for relationships? You know, right down to the core, like, is anybody going to love me? Can I ever get back to the things that made me come alive? What does it even mean to feel alive anymore? I mean, that's just spiral and not unique, unfortunately. Right. So... You know, I was, had some tough decisions to make. I had a job lined up in Canada, but I had no health insurance. I had no family to go to. And my things were uncontrollable. So I did what I knew what to do, which is, you know, be resourceful. Figure it out. You figured everything else out, Amanda. You can do this one, too. And so I started spending my savings, you know, in a desperate way to try and find solutions and that was, I, you know, injecting things into my body that aren't legal in the United States, paying doctors in other countries to make deals. I mean, just weird stuff. Weird stuff to try to, like, and at this point, you still didn't know what it was. I right? didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah. And so, then, you yeah, know, what were you trying to do? Get rid of the pain? or Basically do, like, some sort of dramatic cleanse because I didn't mm-hmm. know it was going. So kill anything that's not supposed to be in my body. Right. Clean anything out that's not, that maybe I've... Mm-hmm 
accumulated over the years, you know, spiritual work, deal with, you know, emotional blocks, contact healers, uh, acupuncture, massage, and that's just benign compared to some of the weird things that I did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I don't regret that. It was part of my exploration. Um, you know, and then the money started going away. Hmm. And um, I didn't have anywhere to go. And I had met a man who was much younger than myself. He was 19 at the time. Country bumpkin. You know, I'd travel all over the world, been to combat. And we had basically nothing in common. Um, and I was desperate. And he was very convincing and said, you know, I, I'll love you. And, you know, as I cried and thought, there's no way. After months, you know, six months of seeing my life fall apart, I was convinced nobody's ever going to want me. And mm. it's all gone. And so here was this, you know, this projection of this hero that I needed to believe was real and that somebody would want me and somebody could help me when I'd exhausted myself. And so without knowing him for very long, uh, you know, he said, oh, let me help you. I'll get you an apartment so I could be seen at the hospital. I didn't know anyone in this city. And he did that. And within a month, turned around and said, you know, I can't really afford this anymore. So we're going to need to get married. And I remember just on the phone with my mom crying, saying, like, I don't know if I should do this. And knowing that she didn't have the resources, emotional or financial or anything to help me, she just said, well, you could always divorce them. <laughs> This is like the quintessential thing she regrets the most in her life. You know, and all things work for good, you know. They do. And so several days later, he kept telling me, we have to do this, we have to do this. And I was weak and vulnerable and did the most resourceful thing I could to help myself. So I did. Um, and, and that was part of a fascinating journey of learning some healthy and not healthy ways to be resourceful. And again, I don't regret that. You know, fasting forward, that man turned out to be, uh, that ended up being a very unhealthy, abusive relationship. And he needed somebody to take care of, which also meant to control. And I didn't understand that. But I learned so many wonderful things. You know, I was going to say. So many yeah. wonderful things. You know, and he did help me. So what would be, like, one, just one of the wonderful things you may have learned? You know, despite some of his behavior that mm. was clinically very dangerous, there is always a reason behind abuse. And it, I, I don't permit or support or, uh, or applaud any of those behaviors. Absolutely not. I actually learned how to take care of myself in the midst of that. And it, that was very empowering. And I learned that and a real visceral level, if you are being abused, it is because that person has suffered. And the response to their own suffering is to inflict pain, and often they're not even aware that they're doing it. Trauma begets trauma. Like, this is not my philosophy, this is science. But I got to really experience what that was all about. And years later, after our divorce, and I divorced him based on grounds of mental cruelty, I learned hmm. that he had brain cancer. All that time, you know, in a section of his brain that was responsible for emotional and behavioral control. Now, that's not a crutch he could walk on to say that it's okay that I, that I did and said the things that I did. Mm -hmm. But that man and there were other things that had happened in his life that caused him great suffering. And that was a lesson on compassion. Of course you take care of yourself you become empowered to know what is healthy, what is not. You get the mechanisms, you learn the skills, and you get out. And you do it with an air of consciousness and compassion, knowing that suffering always begets more suffering. And then you don't hate the source. You can, in some ways, remove yourself in a way that cares for you and the other person, You know, trusting that time and goodness will have its way in their life, that they would see their eyes through truth. I learned that huge so then what 
Uh, you had you got divorced. You got away from it. No, you we said, were we were together for about six years, and uh-huh. during during that journey, I realized this question that I mm-hmm. grew up with that I thought was so foundational, so quintessential. You know, what am I going to be when I grow up? Mm-hmm. I thought, well, that doesn't matter. What happens when that question goes away? Because it did. And that's a very real phenomenon. For 24 years old, I never considered that maybe that mm-hmm. was an option. But it was my reality. And so uh, I sort of had my c- coming to Jesus <laughs> moment, you know, lying in the bathtub, being married to this abusive person with um, in severe pain. At this time, I had um, an inkling of what was going on um, and had a few tumors removed. It, and I'll get into more what, what that was all about. But I realized at that moment, you know, that question doesn't matter. And so here are my options. This is no way to live. So I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to die figuring out how to really live and find a new question. Because the old one doesn't really work. And so then it was this spiritual inquiry of really trusting myself or, you know, at that time it was the Holy Spirit or God within me. And there's so many different ways to look at that. The knower that knows. You know, we always get better with truth, whether or not it's our body. When we feed ourselves the things that make us feel healthier, we get better. You know, when we tell ourselves a lie about about what our body needs, we're going to suffer the consequences. And so I really started leaning into that inner voice, listening on a daily basis, and even doing some experiments to see what is it that I'm hearing. And so then my commitment wasn't to this old question, it was to a way of living, which was to follow that, you know, with, with determination and perseverance. And it wasn't about doing something in the world that was about being a specific type of person. And that was, would be somebody who would say yes to myself and yes to life. And that's where I really learned about the right question, which is the crux of what I speak about. And the question is, you know, in the context of my life circumstances, who do I want to be? And that was originally inspired by Jesus. Because I thought, if there is a God, why is this happening? And what's up with this Mm, Jesus guy and all these other spiritual guides out there? And I thought, you know, Jesus really was creating a blueprint for a living. Well, who was he? He was compassion. He was perseverance. He was kindness. He was truth. He was commitment. And I thought, oh my gosh, here's the big experiment, the biggest life experiment So I began writing that down like a recipe, all of these character logical traits. And every morning and every night I would look at this list and I would say, right, Amanda, it doesn't really matter what you do today. Give that up. But this, this list, these character traits, this is how you're going to show up and just do today. And that small little practice of desperation of knowing what does it mean to follow God or follow truth or a different blueprint for a living that no one had ever taught me, really practically laid it out like that, uh, that saved my life. And, you know, you've read a lot of things in my bio, really led to a pathway that really was abundantly and exceedingly more than I could have ever asked for. Or and continues to be, doesn't it? Yeah, and today, you know, the story's not the same. Yeah. The question's still the same. The story's not the same, but the question is the same. Is that what you just said? Right. The past story is the same. I'm writing new chapters now, yes. right? Yes. But the question always remains, you know, and it's a constant. Even now when I start to lose my way a little bit and mm-hmm. get caught up in the doing of the world or performance mm-hmm. or fear or pain, it's going back to that, you mm-hmm. know, in the context of my life circumstances, who do I want to be? And that releases some of the responsibility from moving the entire world, by the way. I can't do that anyway, but I can do this. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate for me to even ask, is there a point where you actually, rather than ask the right question, what do you want to be, is like, who are you? That's a great question. Who are you? And I think essentially we are that. 
You know, that's our birthright. It's the DNA of our soul. Like to be compassion, to be kindness, to be joy, to be resiliency. That is essentially who we are. And we unlearn that, Mm -hmm. you know. So language is fun in that it's really about getting to a context that touches you. And, you know, some would say, you know, who do you want to be? That's like somewhere out there. Like, who are you right now? Love it. I love that too. Mm -hmm. But you're always striving to who you want to be. Yeah, moving closer to who who I am, as you say. Who we all are. Yeah, I just, I have this visual of you at some point just stopping. And everything that came before becomes present in you now of who you are. Mm. And then you get up and keep moving. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay, so then what happened? So that question... You know, when your focus is compassion, when you wake up and you say, I am compassion today, how's that going to look? Life will provide you a series of opportunities to be that. It's amazing. You could be at the grocery store, see an elderly woman struggling to grab something. All of a sudden, maybe it wasn't on your radar before, but now you feel like helping her because that's your focus. We always know our energy goes where her focus is. And oh my gosh, that transformed a lot of my decisions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before life was, you know, pretty fun, right? I had a business. I was in a band. Fun was easy. Finding guys was easy. Work was easy. Success, just easy. Give me, give me, give me. It feels good to have so much juicy, just beefing up my own ego, my own life. But a lot of that was honestly so Mm self-serving, independent of what I did for my country, which I'm proud of. I was living the high life in my own little, small, individual way. And the question, when your focus is compassion or kindness, you can't do that just by yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. And life gives you opportunities. So I started feeling really motivated and inspired in an organic way to respond to opportunities differently. So I um, traveled to South America and volunteered in an orphanage. I would never done anything like that before. You know, but even day to day things like while I was there, I felt compelled to learn about these children. I was there to teach music and build a library. They didn't need that. They mm-hmm. needed families. Mm-hmm. So that question motivated me to <clears throat> meet with a social worker, write all their stories down, take pictures of every single one of them. And I did yeah, that. Yeah, all this is on your website too, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a young, wild, paying attention. Let's see what happens next adventure that was committed to this question, but people responded to me differently. So mm-hmm. later on, I went and spoke about these children when I came back to the United States and this family came forward in the audience and said, you know, we're interested. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing because as my orientation changed, people started to respond differently around me. And then I realized I did the same thing too. And so then came in this lesson of the interconnectedness, how my compassion inspires compassion and how their joy inspires my joy. Um, and that was an incredible lesson too. And they, this family adopted three children from the orphanage. They came to my hometown. I think you know, that started a cascade of hundreds of humanitarian projects that I've served along with people, even independently in Africa, the United States, Mexico. Um, because it was the, those opportunities really were the answer to the right question. And if you want to show up as love, as generosity, as encouragement, as tender heartedness, you pick, you know, you pick, but the world has a need for that and it will show you where to go. You know, the, the, the knower that knows the knower that knows, and then just showing up. Just showing up, and oh my gosh, you know, for driven showing up's people. huge. I know a lot of people that struggle, and they just because they don't show up. And it seems like something that you, you know, as I've been a witness to our encounters, mm-hmm. that's something that you make yourself available for. Even though you're a driven, successful person, you're available to what is and to show up as the answer to the right question, which is how do I show up as joy and compassion and kindness and relinquish my agenda. And that's the miracle place, you know, where healing happens in our psyche and our community. 
and where living happens. Because, uh, you know, in that sort of in the way of doing that, you get out of your way. You become something, you become something much larger than yourself. And you find out that you are and can be so much larger than what you think. And to be, yeah, and absolutely. I know you know that one. And when you're in the essence of that, when you mm-hmm. surrender to it, because it's not something that you do. Mm-hmm. And if you're a driven person like me, sometimes a crazy driven person, it's letting that go so that you can just experience that. And to be connected with compassion with other people in community mm-hmm. is is a joy that my perception of pain is even different. When mm-hmm. I'm in that place, I'm not feeling any pain, (laughs) you know, so that's the place of vitality and healing. And I look at spending time with people that seem to show up, um, wherever I'm at, like you said, it could be this, uh, it could be the person at the grocery store. It could be somebody at a coffee house, you know, sometimes I'll notice somebody's working really, really hard and I'll just stop them. Mm. I'll just stop them and, and just basically ask them. And I did this the other day down, down the street, and I simply just said, thanks for being here and for your lovely service. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. Can you see that I have tears in my eyes yes. right now? Yeah. You sharing that. You know, sometimes we get caught up, or I get caught up, I'll speak for myself, mm-hmm. in wanting to do big things. Mm-hmm. And I've done, like, some big things. I know you have, yeah. But, and that's not necessarily where the miracle happens. It's the moment to moment. You know, it's not right. trying to do a big thing. It's right. just being available. And when I think about there have been people, John, who stepped into my life, just like you shared this story. Someone who wasn't doing a big thing, but they made an absolute 100% difference in the trajectory of my life. Yeah, you told me the other day of a situation with Rotary, right? Wasn't it with her? Yeah, there are so many. So, yeah, within Rotary... And, and you know, on 800 numbers when I'm dealing with health insurance, when people just showed up as completely available, it really changed the trajectory of my life. Mm-hmm. Rotary is a great example. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that because I, I got, I've gotten really curious about it, what it is. We've heard of it. We've all heard of it. And my friend Eric Weber, um, who is a global messenger for the Southern California Special Olympics. Mm. Um, I just saw he put up something on YouTube where he spoke at the Rotary in San Diego. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, Rotary's been around since the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. And they have one mantra, motto, which foundational is? belief, which is service above self. Ironically. Service above self. Service above self. And ironically, it really means surrendering to the right question, right? Rather than my ego or my own agenda, how do I Mm -hmm. step out of that into compassion and kindness and generosity and service of one another? Because when we are embodying that, we are of service to the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Rotary is a network, a worldwide network of traditionally professionals. I'm not calling myself a professional. (laughs) That's a loaded term. So often we think of like, you know, stuffy people. Yeah, I I hear you. Yeah. All sorts of individuals, men and women, different walks of life, different demographics, cultures, religions, races, who really have this one mission. And they come together in their local community groups Mm -hmm. called Rotary Clubs. There's 34,000 of them around the world. Really? amazing network. I mean, we have 63 clubs right here in Southern California. Wow. And it's a volunteer network. Everybody's a volunteer, Mm -hmm. everybody. And they come together with one mission to serve their community. They also do international projects, but they come together and you've got people who are maybe talk producers, people who are violinists, people who are bankers, people who own landscaping companies, and they come together and have a great time and say, let's learn. So they invite speakers in, they grow together weekly. And then the main thing is, is they find ways of using their individual talents and their researches to serve. Hmm. And it's not about what are we going to do, but what does the world need? So they go out and they canvas you know, does the school need a new library? Do we need um, to help single mothers with child care in our community? Do we need to rehabilitate this park because it's inviting crime? What is? It's creative. It's dynamic. And it's a place where like-minded people come to grow together and to celebrate. So it is non-governmental. Correct. For the people, by the people. Gr- very grassroots. Yes. 
Yeah, because that seems to be missing somewhat in government. In government, it is very grassroots, and ironically, we support a lot of the holes where the government isn't providing resources, like a lot of other NGOs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But different in that you know, it's often business professionals who are um, you know relinquish their stake in the game. And one of the things I love the most, this is also in alignment with the right question, is. They live by this code of ethics called the four-way test. And whether or not you buy into Can Rotary. stop you for a minute? Yeah. You say they do. Rotary, we do. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. We do. And I very much believe in this. Teach your children this. Even Which are, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What are the four things? It, it's called the four-way test. Oh, the four-way so test. So basically the four-way test is in anything that I, I'm going to own it, think say or do, I ask myself the following four questions. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Is it beneficial to all concerned? And will it build goodwill and better friendships? And if one of those answers no, you don't do it. Now, regardless of, I see you raising your eyebrows. It's powerful. No, I know. And, and, and there were <clears throat> two thumbs up. If I had more thumbs, they'd be all up. <laughs> no, I love it. I had no idea. No idea whatsoever. An amazing group of people and a model to live by. Right. And, you know, you can be with diversity. And yeah. I love that, too. Yeah. So what's your relationship with Rotary and uh, being a vet? Because you've been awarded some things, right? Um, yes. I, well, first of all, I joined Rotary in 2005. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I actually don't know. Okay. Of course you don't know. The inquiry is more to myself because I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> scroll back the timeline. Um, 2009. Okay. And since then, and the whole reason for doing that is I thought I want to be in community together with people who believe mm -hmm. what I believe, which is service above self. Now, I didn't call it that at the time, but that's what I wanted to live. And I want to be in community, and I love being connected to people, and I want to grow, and I want to have adventures and making the world a better place. <laughs> and so um, Rotary had sponsored me as a teenager to be at a foreign exchange student, but I forgot about them. I didn't forget about the impact they made, but I thought it's a bunch of old people, rich people, you know, a bunch of old guys. Hmm. And how would a 29-year-old <laughs> woman fit into that? And I did. It was awkward for you. At the beginning, until I realized that's not the spirit of it. Mm -hmm. There may be some older men around me. And mm -hmm. that's changing a lot now. We're getting a lot of young people, a lot of women in Rotary. Nice. Um, so that's really not the case. It was a story I made up in my mind, basically. Of course. Yeah. Like usually, many other stories. <laughs> it's usually an inside job. <laughs> right? But Rotary became the support system for me to do all these amazing humanitarian projects. I um, worked in Uganda as a public health educator after I got my master's, mm. uh, worked with wounded warriors at Balboa Hospital. Nice. So some really neat things. And because I have, getting back to your question, because I have a passion for the military, um, I was able to plug in in a variety of other ways. Um, because of my own experience of trauma, I work with the Trauma Resource Institute, you know, got involved, Rotary got involved with that. And then my big project was realizing that all service members have a heart to serve. Mm. They're willing to give their life. Okay, they get a stipend. That's to help them survive, but it's not commensurate with what they're willing to offer. Mm. That's like not, saying somebody. Who, <laughs> it's like saying somebody who shows up to build the school year, give them a donut, and call it even. It's like <laughs> no. <laughs> their offering is so much bigger than we could ever say thank you for, mm -hmm. and they want to serve. And so how do we get them into community for a bigger peace mission? Because it isn't that at the heart of every military member, we want to kill everyone. Right. We want to serve. And so I thought, how do we create the first club, the first organization of military members and their family and supporters from all different countries serving together towards peace? It's like a little United Nations with Rotary. But how do we do that? So many different barriers, like... How do you even get these people together? And I did a bunch of focus groups and figured out that we could do this online using Facebook. So to me, it became about building peace and sharing stories and camaraderie and bringing the hearts of all these people and all these nations together 
with this one purpose to serve. You know, which again ties into the question, because when we serve, we are the answer to the right question. That is how we show up. That's that. (laughs) That's that. And that's called United Services Rotary. If anybody's curious. Yeah, we'll put links in the show notes. Awesome. So there's going to be a lot of links in these show notes. And just a reminder, anybody that's listening, that's alternativehealthtools.com. It's a podcast. And uh, we're, are you up for doing a video blab a couple of weeks down the road? Sure. Do you know what that is? No. Good. I'll show you Do you, you love later. my enthusiastic I yes. love it, man. <laughs> she so, just says, yeah. So got me into trouble. Before. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I, it would have been fun to be in the car when you first uh, had your first experience driving a car. <laughs> <laughs> this is based on a st- <laughs> Well, I, I get this. I get this. When I, when I was in seventh grade, you know, it was real popular. Everybody's starting bands and everything. And mm-hmm. I wanted to be in a band. And some friend of mine came up to me and said, we're starting a band. And, I, and, and he said, we're looking for a blaze, bass player. I said, I play bass. And he said, great, we're going to be rehearsing Thursday night. Okay, I'll be there. And I went home and took, um, went to the bank, got some money out, <laughs> bought a bass and an amp. And, oh, my goodness. Uh, two days later, I was and in a band. And then you were. So you owned it inside. Absolutely. That's where it all be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I get I get the model I get the model. So uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the healing part too. Mm-hmm. You know, because you told me the other day a pretty interesting, well, fascinating story. Actually, you got to a place, right, where you you were still having problems. You were still right. Right. So what happened to my recovery? Essentially, my physical recovery. Your physical recovery, and actually, what it is you might have had or thought you had. Gotcha. Does it have a name, or do you not want to mention it? No, it does. It does, and I'm very comfortable mentioning it. It, um, The doctors, I went through a bunch of investigative surgeries, and they mm-hmm. removed a few tumors. Okay. And they said, we're not quite sure what's, go- what's going on here. We're going to send it to pathology. And I actually went to a plastic surgeon specifically because I was told that they're better listeners. Mm. And because nobody would cut to open my abdomen, nothing was showing up on imaging, but if I pushed really hard, I could feel something there. Mm. So I went to a plastic surgeon and I said, look, I know this sounds a little strange, but there's something here. I can feel it. It doesn't show up on imaging. No harm, no foul. If I could cut myself, I would, but I can't. So I want to pay you to cut right here in my abdomen. I'm just showing John here where I'm where they made the incision. And I said, and wake me up if you find something, because this has been making me sick for two years at that point. And so they did the surgery. I was under general anesthesia and then they woke me up in the middle and there are two walnut sized tumors in the doctor's hand. Amazing physician at Washington, DC, Dr. Susan Otero. And she said, let's send it to pathology. So pathology came back and they said, well, they are, fibrotic fatty tumors but we're not sure what's going on and i thought you know what i'm i'm good you took it out life's going to return back to normal i can get out of this dangerous relationship situation get back to my life in canada play music started to feel hopeful again and then life took an interesting twist i realized that that swelling i had on the right side of my body actually was it referred pain Mm-hmm. It, these tumors were growing like a grape cluster all down my right thigh, my right buttocks into my back. Aggressively. Aggressively and yeah. fast. And so I went to one of the most amazing medical resources online, Google, <laughs> <laughs> and learned about this rare fibrotic tumor condition called Durkham's disease. I was named after the physician who first discovered it. And essentially, it's a rare, fibrotic, painful, fatty tissue disorder. It's rare, it's progressive, Mm. and it's incurable. And, um, you know, at that point, that's about the time that I had my come to Jesus, I'm going to either kill myself or uh, I'm going to come to the truth of what makes me come back to life. And so I began an investigation and... I found the world's leading researcher on my disease. Her name's Dr. Karen Herbst. And at that time, she was an endocrinologist at the University of California in San Diego and the VA hospital. And gratefully, I was under the VA healthcare system then and was able to see her. And so I flew across the country. I'd never been to California. And I'd sent her my pathology slides. And, you know, doctors are so busy. So I think I was in her office a total of like eight minutes. <laughs> really? And she, I was so excited and also scared to know sure. uh, what's going on. 
And I sat in this small cubicle office in a metal folding chair. She had already examined me. I was waiting for her to come back in the room. She had looked at my pathology slides. She came in the room and she shut the door. And the conversation was very short. And she said to me, well, the good news, Amanda, is that I can confirm this is what you have. But the bad news is I don't have any answers because I don't have any help. And it was in that moment that I felt like time stood still. You know, I looked around her office and just took in everything and all of the books and slides and very disorganized. She was so busy, a researcher, a doctor, a teacher, a parent, pictures of her daughter that she didn't see as often as she'd like to. She was so overwhelmed and had taken on individually a rare disease that had no funding. She had no partnership at that time. And she was just being honest with me. And in that moment of time freeze, I made a decision inside of myself. And I thought, well, if I don't help her, who will? Like what, I'm just going to wait for some superhero to fly in the scene and come up with the answers. And so I made a decision that if I ever became well enough, I'd somehow return to her laboratory to help. I never told her that. But I got back on the plane to Illinois. Or at that time, I was in Washington, and I started making copious notes. What makes me feel better? What makes me feel worse? Tell yourself the truth about that. Start there, I thought. And own it. Be willing to let the things go that are not life-enhancing, whether or not it's a, something you drink, something you eat, an pr- activity you participate in, a relationship you have. Granted, I couldn't leave. I didn't have the resources to leave my marriage at that time. But I started cutting a lot of things out, getting back to a diet that, well, you know what? This feels right for me. And testing it over and over again like a scientist. And I learned the value of live like a scientist, which would mean don't be so attached to your hypothesis. Maybe this is good for you. Maybe it's not. You know, find out what the consequences are. Then repeat the experiment. Once you know, don't act like you don't know. Live the truth, right? And so I started making notes on that and I emailed her and We shared a few email exchanges through the years, but I slowly started to get a little bit better, enough that I could do these humanitarian projects, that I could do some outreach. I didn't think, you know, I was, uh, uh, they said, you're probably never going to be able to go to college. You know, we could put a pain pump in your spine. You're probably going to be disabled by the time you're 30, I was told. And so they'd instilled all these beliefs in me, but still there was a part of me that thought, no. Maybe not. And it started out as a maybe not and grew to a more proclaimed no over time through time and experience of knowing I could trust the knower that knows. I could trust myself when I'm following through on what it is that I know that I need to do to take care of myself. Um, And so it became clear to me as I did this humanitarian work and as I started receiving more hope for my own future that that was my mission to build hope in the future for others. And it was about the everyday, showing up, seeing what opportunities come my way, you know, being bold, saying yes to myself, saying yes to the world. And the paradox of having lost everything is like, well, I've got nothing to lose. Sure, let's try this. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't know what I'm doing. Neither does anybody when they first start. (laughs) So I started working with demographics that needed hope in a future. And Mm -hmm. I decided I'm going to try going to school. I'm going to take a few classes, see how that feels. So fast forward with this mission in mind to build hope in a future for as many people as I could. Uh, got accepted at the University of Illinois at Champaign a School. I never thought I'd be able to go to or manage that workload. And I did because I was passionate about it. And day to day, asking the right question and taking care of myself. And I got to work with a lot of people who needed hope in a future, disabled Um, people, people with physical handicaps. I tutored people with developmental disabilities. I worked with Alzheimer's patients. But the story and the mission was always the same. And I saw that question was the answer, not only for me, but for all of us. And so I graduated from there. I never thought I'd go to college um, as the top graduating student in my college. And so... Amazing. And I had so much help, right? Because people were showing up in amazing ways for me too. 
You know, I studied hard. I'm a pretty sharp cookie, but other people showed up for me in that moment to moment asking the right question. You know, I, I took care of a dying parent, my father, in my senior year. And I had to go to Loyola Hospital in Chicago and chemo and radiation. I was the only one there taking care of this. And my professor said, you know what? Do your final exam from your laptop in the waiting room. Do it on Saturday. No worries. You don't have to be here. They were willing to show up as the answer to the right question for me. Right? So my victory is their victory. I can't claim that. I did my part. You can share it. I, I share it. I share it. And so many people have helped me. So all these people were teaching me along the way, and they still are. You know, I went on to go to to grad school, and predominantly with this, with the hope, share at the highest level. What more can I offer? Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's been a lot of people in your life that have helped you, right? Oh, a ton. Yeah, a ton. So would you say that it's common for all these people that they absolutely expected nothing in return? For those people who have made the most profound impact... Mm-hmm. Never once did I ever sense that they had any attachment. It was always my goodwill, mm-hmm. my healing, my journey. It was their victory. They understood mm-hmm. that my victory was their victory. Mm-hmm. And probably one of the most profound lessons in that, and it took me so long to get this, I felt so needy for a while, like, oh my gosh, look at this. I've got to navigate all this stuff. I need so much help right now. And one of my great teachers told me, your gifts, your needs, sorry, your needs are a gift to the world because your needs will bring out those parts of the other person, like compassion and um, care and tenderness and generosity. Your needs will bring that out in other people and they get to be that person. There's another word I would use. What's that? It's, I mean, you and I have met twice, but uh, the word I would use is witness. In witnessing you and wanting to help you, I gain so much. I experience it myself. Mm. But it's the witnessing. So in this word witness, what is what do you gain? What is the experience of that? I mean, not well, just with, with me, wit- but for with other people. Nith- with witnessing, there's no thought about what am I, what am I gaining from it. Um, it's, to me, it's, like a, it's just a level of experience. And for me, it reaffirms everything I believe in my core. Hmm. That I you know, came into this life to love and to serve. That's because it. that is who you are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's maybe not for everybody. So the witnessing for me is just uh, giving me an experience um, and a possibility. So you, uh, what your mentor said, what you said about you, gift is in allowing people to witness and help you gives them hope. I see that clearly because you. I mean, I'm probably going to count it. I'm going to go back and listen to this and count how many times you use the word hope. There's a lot of hope in you, yeah. and it's the law of circulation. We talked about that Tuesday night, right? Oh, absolutely. And so that's that's in the flow of of life. And when you're in the law of circulation, then you know you're giving, you're giving, and it's all coming back, right? And that's sort of the paradox, you know. When I've been afraid, or when we are afraid, mm-hmm. the tendency is to close in and shut down and give less. Like I've got to preserve or mm-hmm. take care of number one, and. There is a. I'm definitely not diminishing the importance of taking care of yourself. But no, the, you aren't. The, Be- the paradox is, you know, when you give, you actually receive, and it may not be in the way that when you relinquish your agenda to what that looks like. I mean, life can become a beautiful adventure, and just trusting that, and, and when your heart says, mm-hmm. "I want to give because." I want to be a witness to healing. I want to be a participant. This is fun, you know, versus like the five minute thrill you get from playing Candy Crush. No, no, no <laughs> haterade on the Candy Crush lovers in the world. <laughs> or like the online shopping experience, you know, where you, where you can feel high for a few minutes. Or reality TV. Or reality TV, or like this run through the In and Out, you know, hamburger stand. And I, you know, you can love all those things and that's okay too. Mm hmm. Per, like real pervasive joy that you feel like, wow, my life really means something. So what do you think people need to do? If there's one thing in the world they need to do. What is it they need to do? 
I think what they need to do is claim for themselves the core of who they are. Make that their number one priority, which is to focus some time and attention on that. And how do you do that? Well, people have practices of Mm -hmm. improving in a variety of ways. Some people make lists. Some people post stuff. Some people start groups. Some people make music. Some people do a ceremony. Um, But to own that, we know through repetition comes mastery. I play the violin and... The only way I've ever gotten better is by doing it over and over and over again. So anytime you have a focus, it's, you know, when you're in a marriage or in a relationship, you're like, our focus is the health of this relationship. That's what we're here to do. You lose sight of your focus, you lose sight of the growth. And so it's to define, like, make it a point. You only have one life to live, you know, to be filled with joy, to be the essence of um, joy and compassion. And you get to decide what you're going to embody. And the the ancillary kind of ha-ha on the side is, you know, you'll do amazing things. Let go of what that looks like. You know, all of your story, your personality, your passion, all of your little quirks, that's all on purpose. Use it as you learn to show up more as this, peeling away the layers, you know, learning to let go, have an adventure, be willing to be wrong, I thought you were going to say raw. And raw. Yeah. Yeah, totally open. And fortunately, some of us have to get our asses kicked (laughs) in order to to get that. And some people don't. And I love all of those journeys. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you've had them all, huh? (laughs) You are multidimensional. Is there anything else you want to cover, you want to talk about? Um, I think you've touched on a lot of great opportunities. You know, what does it mean to be in a network? You mentioned Rotary. Mm-hmm. Find like-minded people. Mm-hmm. Seek, lean into the knower that knows inside of you. So what can people do? You know, it's not just about making a decision. What's your mm-hmm. focus? Mm-hmm. But where are you going to put your energy to support that focus? Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of ways to do that, you know, to grow in your understanding of that. That's to lean into your knower that knows. Ask yourself with great honesty. What is the next right step for me in moving towards embodying this, becoming the higher, highest version of myself? Take a chance. Life is risky, but the bigger risk is not becoming that person. Because by the way, there are no do-overs, in these, not in this body, in this <laughs> lifetime. It's it. Take the risk. Yeah. Find a community. You know, there's Rotary. There are other service organizations that are living service. There are a a number of spiritual um, groups of thought. But it's your truth. It's your journey. Lean into that. You know, learning to trust yourself more. Trust yourself in the little things. What do I want to eat for breakfast, really? What do I want to study? What do I want to share? And if you feel vulnerable, great, because now you're getting somewhere. Because life's sticky, and that's how you morph out of the cocoon. Mm -hmm. It's a sticky mess. Welcome to the adventure. Become something beautiful. Nice. How can people get more of you? Uh, I think you need to start a website called (laughs) moreofamanda.com. Well, fortunately, I have this friend, John, who's inspired me to consider podcasting or blabbing. Or, or webbing, I don't even know, something on the <laughs> video. <laughs> um, so keep a lookout for that. You can always find me on my website, which is amandawertz.com. A-M-A-N-D-A-W-I-R-T-Z. That's correct. Dot com. You can contact me through there. You can find me on Facebook, same name. Yeah, by the way, beautiful website. Thank you. I understand a Canadian company did it. It's really one of the nicest sites I've seen in a while. Thank you. She is an incredible artist and a premier musician up in Canada. Oh, Actually, really? a Who Juno is nominee. Who is her, it? Her name's Amanda Rayum. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, an incredible designer, a visionary, and also a humanitarian leader. She's really working with Canada to create music to support a lot mm-hmm. of the um, indigenous women and children who have been really? raped and murdered. Amazing human being. Wow. Well, she might be next on the show, huh? She's a great person to have in your life, have on your podcast, have on your radio station. She's just about to come out with a new album. Mm-hmm. So her her website, Amanda Rayum, R-H-E-A-U-M-E dot com. Great. Well, we'll stick it in the show notes as well. 
Amanda, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I have this feeling. Yeah, I have this feeling it could be first of a couple or something. Please visit alternativehealthtools.com. There is a section, contact us. And uh, I would encourage us to do a blab in a couple of weeks. And I think after the show here, I'm going to take uh, Amanda up to the other part of the studio and show her what that's all about. But if you want to find out, just go to alternativehealthtools.com and click on the About page, and you're going to find out a little bit more about how to get involved in blab. If you're the kind of person that likes to engage with others and have conversations and uh it's a really wonderful place to start, and uh, we're using it more and more. Basically, scheduling a blab maybe a week or two after each podcast's release, so it gives an opportunity to interact with the people that are on the show. So, until next time. <laughs>